Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now a while back we looked at this questionable combination, a Biostar motherboard with a built-in or integrated processor. You may be looking at this and wondering why I've titled this video something something laptop processor, but in actual fact the AMD FX 8800P that comes pre-attached to this board is originally a laptop part and it was at one point the best laptop CPU available for a few months in 2015. It's a quad core 15 watt chip that boosts to 3.4 gigahertz and it features integrated graphics that are about half as capable as the Vega 3 iGPU found within the Athlon 200GE. It costs £75 in the UK and when you take into consideration the cost of a new Athlon and an AM4 board, this config probably isn't worth it unless you want or need something very very low power. In the past we put the integrated Radeon R7 graphics to the test and found that they were capable to some extent mainly for lightweight games and when I paired my Vega 64 with this chip the bottleneck was so bad that it caused unbearable stutter. Today however I'm going to be using this, the Radeon RX 5500 XT, one of the best entry level graphics cards you can buy right now and one that may be a little more reasonable in cooperation with the integrated FX processor. This is what happens when you pair a GPU with a CPU intended for laptops. To go with our pairing we have 16 gigs of DDR4 clocked at the board's maximum supported frequency, 2133 MHz. I've also hooked up my 1TB SSD to ensure an overall snappier experience, but let's get into it and kick off with the first game. Some are older and some are new, but I've tried to include a variety to show off, I use the term loosely, what this combo can do. Excuse the 2009 style recording, my capture card doesn't like this processor and the Radeon overlay software for internal capturing doesn't much care for it either, causing immense stutter. Now we've got 10 games in total to get through, so let's start with some good old fashioned Battlefield 3, which is still a personal favourite of mine. What you'll notice throughout is how the processor is likely maxing out, so to speak, hovering around 90 to 100% usage. That is expected, and honestly, if you were to use a more powerful GPU, then you'd likely see no real gains at this resolution. 1080p medium was as high as we could go and still retain an almost solid 60fps. 58 and 40 were the official figures, and this result surprised me to be honest. Battlefield 3 is playable on this integrated 4-core, four 4-threaded four laptop CPU. The original Crisis is not. 41 was a good average or good enough at 1080p high, but the 1% low of 5 meant that we were essentially playing an interactive PowerPoint presentation. Some moments of the game were smooth, don't get me wrong, but every time the enemy came around the corner our frame rate suffered, and for some reason this combination of parts caused a problem with my monitor that meant it was stuck at a 24Hz refresh rate. Crisis 2 ran a lot better, much better in fact even with DX11 and the high resolution textures enabled. The problem was that the 24Hz refresh rate issue persisted, so if the gameplay looks choppy, don't worry, it's not, it's just my display messing around. I have noticed this with some other hardware, but usually alt-tabbing out of the game and then back into it resolves the problem. This time I couldn't get this makeshift fix to work in either Crisis game, so I guess it's just one of those things that might occur if you're using similar hardware. 85 FPS was the average and 45 was the 1% figure. The game was played at the high preset, which in this case means low, but it looks almost the same as the highest preset as far as me and my terrible eyesight is concerned. CSGO at 1080p ran a little worse than it did at 720p with just the integrated graphics according to my original results, which I showed at the start. This is a CPU intensive game though, and I'm not that surprised. I am surprised that Battlefield 3 of all games ran better, but that's just how it goes. The footage here is from a bot match, as it's more convenient to record, but the figures were taken from an online Dust 2 game, and honestly, the frame rate figures weren't too much, if at all, different when tackling the bots. 
Now Minecraft is the only game I tested at 2160p resolution today. It runs very well with a solid 60fps and this Imagination Island Nvidia map looks pretty cool as well. The settings were reduced as you can see which certainly helped keep a smooth percentile figure but you could probably take advantage of higher settings if you wanted to on hardware like this. Different maps will vary performance wise but Minecraft shouldn't give you too much trouble on older tech. This is the Windows 10 version as well just to put that out there. Far Cry 5 didn't really care about the settings or resolution to be fair, it just sort of hovered around 20 FPS regardless whether we were using the ultra settings or the low settings. Eventually I settled for normal, and while it looks good it didn't run very well. Normally this card would be able to handle most games at 1080p high or ultra and still maintain 60 FPS, but it just goes to show you that your choice of processor can be detrimental. My personal recommendation as a minimum for this graphics card would probably be say an i3 9100F or Ryzen 3 1200. Other used CPUs like Intel's older 2500K will still be a good pairing for this card as well. Anyway, Far Cry 5 will spike to 30 FPS at times, but it's not consistent and it's not ideal. Now surprisingly the Outer Worlds will do quite well once the map has loaded in. When you first select your previous save the environment sort of appears gradually and turning the camera will cause the game to freeze. After waiting a few seconds though and as you begin to make your way through this awesome in-game world things will settle down and run a little smoother. 51 was an okay average though the 1% low figure of 20 does mean that some problems occurred. I started benchmarking after the environment had fully loaded by the way, otherwise this figure would be more like 1 or 0. Now ladies and gentlemen, prepare to witness a miracle. When I tried Red Dead 2 on just the integrated graphics in the past it was pretty terrible, but here with the favour performance preset, we were able to meet and exceed 30 FPS with this hardware. That's right, this little laptop chip can handle this visual masterpiece just fine, well, sort of fine anyway, and at this sort of frame rate, it is better experienced in third person. Lowering the settings a bit might get you closer to 60 FPS, but I don't think it's going to be that solid, so to speak. Towns like Valentine and the city of Saint-Denis could cause problems too, though nothing overly problematic, if that makes sense. Now I wasn't sure how to approach PUBG, so I just set the game to very low. 46 and 19 were the vital numbers here, which wasn't too bad, but bear in mind that just like in Red Dead, you may experience more drops in busier areas. I noticed that as I stood with a few other players among some concrete ruins, the FPS counter dropped to around 30, which isn't ideal in a competitive environment, but the 8800p still did better than I thought it would. Honestly, I wasn't sure if we'd be exceeding 30 FPS in any of today's games, so it's outdone itself in that regard. It's still not worth it over an entry level Athlon on the AM4 socket, but it's not bad for a low power solution. Finally, Fallout 4 at medium settings ran very well with close to 60 FPS, even in busier towns. More NPCs on screen meant more dips, but 57 on average wasn't too bad to be honest, and the 1% low wasn't bad either. I also noticed that this didn't really matter what settings you chose for Fallout 4, it could be low, medium, high or ultra. The CPU was, at the end of the day, the limiting factor again, so whilst you may see a few more frames at lower settings, um, yeah, it's not going to be anything significant with this CPU and card combination. Another thing I will mention is that I left the cap on simply to avoid any glitches, glitches that I've seen before when turning it off, but you shouldn't realistically expect to exceed 60 FPS in many areas with this title anyway, so that's worth noting. All in all then, if you can pick one of these combinations up very cheap and you have a graphics card to pair it with, then you may have an okay gaming experience, but going out and actually buying one brand new probably doesn't make too much sense. I'm just surprised that the FX8800P can handle itself when paired with a discrete GPU, considering that this was intended as a laptop CPU at the beginning of its life, and in fact it still is, it's just been soldered to a desktop board. It's not quite as simple as that, I'm sure, but uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you very much for watching this video. 
If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like down below. If you didn't like this video, be sure to leave a dislike down below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully, I'll see all of you in the next one.